this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the fifth book of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 12 through 21. Again, that's Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 21, and we read in Jesus' name. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. For the, Lord your God is, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are exactly who you say you are that you are God of God, light, Lord of Lords, the great and mighty and awesome God. We praise you, Lord, and we pray that as we meditate on your word and your plan of salvation for the world, that the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our gospel reading today and our Old Testament reading have almost the same line. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, on these two commandments hang or depend all the law and the prophets. The word Deuteronomy means second law. If you had a chance to go on the website, uh, you would have seen maybe this week. I I wrote a little thing about it, but I want to give you the cliff notes. Christians often read Deuteronomy as a reiteration of the law. As kind of like, you know, God gave the law in Exodus 20, and now in Deuteronomy, he's just giving a second law, an addendum or an appendix to the law, giving us a further explanation of what he demands, kind of like a sequel to the movie of the Exodus. But if you're expecting the excitement and drama of Exodus to be in the sequel of Deuteronomy, like most movie sequels, you would be pretty disappointed. But if you look at Deuteronomy for what it is, not as a sequel, but really as a preparation for a new people, a new generation to go into the promised land, that disappointment goes away. The only narrative section in Deuteronomy really is towards the end when you see the death of Moses. Everything else about Deuteronomy focuses on the words of God for his people. We must remember the fathers and mothers of the people who received the instruction of Deuteronomy were the people who were in Egypt. But those who are there, though those who are 40 and under at this point, they were never in Egypt. They were just little babies, maybe a few of them, when God spoke with awesome power and thunder and lightning on Mount Sinai. Many of them, well, none of them would remember for sure. They would have only been a few days old at the oldest. And so what we see here in Deuteronomy is not is not really this 2.0 of the law, but it's the law explained and and understood then by those who hear it, this new generation preparing to take the promised land with God as their leader. 
He's saying, this is who my people are. And he gives Deuteronomy. None of those who were in Egypt, we know, were able to go into the promised land because of their lack of faith. Remember the 12 Uh, The 12 spies went into the promised land. They came back. Ten of them gave a bad report, said the land is is filled with giants and will never be able to overtake it. But there were two. And coincidentally, those, it's not a coincidence. It's very much on purpose, much like us being here, that there were two, Jacob and Caleb, who came back and they, instead of giving a bad report, said, trust in the Lord and believe and he will deliver the land to you. And those two men were able to go into the promised land. But through the rest of, the, of Israel, of that generation, they did not believe. But God forgives Israel their sin. He puts it away. But he tells them the consequences of their sin are real. And so those who were in Egypt are not able to go in to the promised land. So th- there are by this time there is by this time an entire generation that has gone by. These people who are now receiving this law, uh, the second law, we would say from Deuteronomy, but really it's the words of God that they are now being directed and taught to understand exactly what they have been called to do and who to be. And so it seems fitting here in Deuteronomy 10 that the the Lord, in a sense, kind of reacts the events of Sinai. He, he reenacts them in the sense that he's giving them new stone tablets we see at the beginning of the chapter. Remember the first stone tablets Moses smashed on the rock when he saw Israel apostatizing and worshiping a golden calf. God restores these tablets to them here in Deuteronomy 10. This time when Moses goes down the mountain, instead of seeing apostasy and seeing horrible idolatry, he comes down and he teaches. And as he teaches is what we see here is the will of God for his people and the grace of God towards them as well. That God has promised them to enter the land which he has promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he promises to sanctify them and to be their God. And verse 12 is where we see the beginning of this teaching. Moses begins with what the Lord requires. He requires fear, obedience, love, and sacrifice. He oftentimes, well, I know I've sat in a number of Bible studies throughout my life where when you get to this idea of the fear of the Lord, we kind of want to sugarcoat it maybe a little. The idea of fear of the Lord, I mean, I remember being taught when I was younger is this kind of like a stove, right? If you put your hand on the stove, you're going to get burnt. And so you learn from a very early age to fear, in a way, the stove. Or perhaps it's also taught that uh, we should have reverence for God. The reverence only, we would say. That is, reverence is like an understanding of, of his awesomeness, that God is awesome. There's some truth in these, but I think that if we begin thinking of God as Uh, We should fear him like we fear a stove. We kind of trivialize trivialize who God really is. We trivialize his awesome, awesome power and his holiness and his justice and righteousness. You see, God is obviously not a stove, right? I mean, that's simple enough. It's an analogy anyway, so we know that out of the gate. But we have to understand heaven and the heaven of heavens and earth and all that is in it belong to him. He created it all. That this God who is asking us to fear him, he is all powerful and he is holy. He is able to visit the iniquity of the sins of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. And he says that he will do so in Exodus 20. And so it's very important for us to understand that that. God is not asking for you to simply 
think of him as a stove and to not violate him in that way. God is not asking of you to have merely reverence for him, but what he is asking for you to do is to fear him because he is holy and he is just. And as ones who are unholy and seeing God's justice, we ought to be fearful. We can't talk about the fear of the Lord being merely reverence. And when we do so, we really are denying God's holiness and his righteousness and justice. The prophet Joel calls the day of the Lord, the the day of the Lord when, when Christ will return. He says it is a great and terrible day. It's terrible because of the wrath of God, which will be poured out upon all those who are not holy all those who are unrighteous. It's terrible because there will be gnashing of teeth and pain that day for those who are unrighteous, for all those who fail to uphold the Lord's command, who fail to do what the Lord requires to fear him, to love him, to walk in his commands and to to sacrifice and serve him. It'll be a really not so great day for them. So when we consider our walk with God, when we consider the commandments of the Lord and what he requires of us, when we examine ourselves as we confess our sin together, or before we come to the altar to receive the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament, we ought to do so with great fear. Because if it weren't for what God has done, that end, the end of weeping and gnashing of teeth would be ours. It would be yours because we are unrighteous. But fear and obedience is not all that God demands. He does not just demand that we would fear him, which I think, as I said, includes being terrified, but also reverence. Uh, He doesn't just demand obedience that we keep all of his commands. He also demands love and sacrifice or service we see here. But it's important to see that with the Lord, fear, love, obedience, and even sacrifice cannot be separated. Those who fear the Lord love and trust the Lord. God demands complete and total love, trust, and fear. And he demands that his people be completely holy as he is holy. He demands also that just as he does does justice for the widow and for the orphan, that we also would do justice for the widow and the orphan. He demands that God's people would be like he is. Not only must they do these things and do them perfectly, but they also must do so with the whole heart and with the right motivations. Everything about God's people must be right. That's what he demands, and that's what Moses is telling us about here in Deuteronomy 10. He's telling us that God does make these demands of his people, those people whom he has chosen, those people whom he has delivered from slavery. He demands perfection from them. I think when we consider that this is the bar, that this is the demand that God has placed on his people, we can't help but look at that bar and go, "Uh -uh." uh-uh. When I was in high school, I was a high jumper for a while, and I couldn't jump very high. I still can't. I could probably jump even less high now. But I remember seeing when there was a it'd go to the regional tournament, the starting height. It's like, oh, I can get that one. But then as the bar goes higher and higher, I go, uh-uh, I can't do that. And so at some point, you just, you jump, you know, trying your best, but knowing, yeah, you're going to hit that bar. And that's, that's where we come to when we see when we see God's law as well. But there's no starting height that we can hit. That the starting height is too high. We can't be perfect. And so we have to look and we have to say, oh God, if this is the case, I'm doomed. But not all hope is lost. Not for the generation that was delivered from Egypt. Not for the generation that's going to take the promised land. And it's not for you either. Because in verse 15, 15, you get one of those beautiful words. In this case, it's the Hebrew word rock. Or as we translate it here in the ESV, yet. 
Sometimes we see it as, but the Lord, right? Here we have, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples as you are this day. So you think about Abraham. I go back to the first Hebrew, right? Abraham and his offspring. Why did God choose them? Did he choose them because they were perfect? Was Abraham perfect? Well, let's think about that. When Abraham was called to be, well, he was given the promise in Genesis 12 when he was called to be God's people, to be his own people for his own purposes, where was Abraham? He was in Ur, and then later on in the north, in Para Aram. And, and there, what was he doing? He was worshiping pagans, pagan idols, false gods, no king, no gods, right? That's the way how we see that often in Hebrew. It's that not gods that he's worshiping. And so you think about Abraham, when he's called, what is he doing? He's worshiping false gods. Then think about his sons. Think about Isaac and Jacob. Where do they go when it's time for them to find a woman to marry? They go to the well, right? That's kind of one of those motifs in Scripture. You go to the well when you try to find a a spouse, of course. I mean, that's what everybody should do. But also, they go to the north. They go back to Pada Aram. They go back to the place where Abraham used to worship false gods, and they marry women who worship false gods, and even one of them tries to sneak some of those false gods into her pack to take back with her right? They're they're not perfect. Abraham lies about his wife being his wife multiple times. And he does so with maybe pious intent, we could say, but he's a liar, right? What we see here is God has called Abraham and his offspring, and he's chosen them above all people without any preceding, present, or subsequent works, but only out of God's pure grace for them. In choosing Abraham and his offspring, God created fear, love, obedience, and sacrifice in them. Israel did not have anything to offer God, and yet God made them a people above all people. God tells his people, whom he has chosen, then to circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. This is obviously a a reference to uh, the circumcision of foreskins of males, uh, at the age of eight days old, that, that God is asking for something different here than that even. Circumcision in the flesh of a male was a sign of the covenant promise of God that he had made with Abraham and his offspring. And this covenant is what made Israel a people and set them apart from God's servant. It's the covenant, it's God's action that does this. But, and so here God says, Not circumcise your boys, although you still need to do that because I've commanded it, by the way, and you must do it perfectly with the right intentions and everything, right? But he says, circumcise your heart. Be no longer stubborn and fail to love, fear, and obey and serve the Lord. No longer seek to be like the other nations and who they are. Instead, circumcise your heart and take up all the demands of the law. And so what is this circumcision of the heart? When God says, circumcise your heart, he's pointing to something more than the right, more than what you do or what the Hebrew people did with their boys when they're eight days old. And in fact, he's not even saying that that's what's necessary. Out of all of the things that God has commanded, what he's saying is what is most necessary is that you be pointed to his promises. And let's see, look at this in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Where does this circumcision of the heart come from? Because this is God's promise for his people. He says that this is something he's going to do. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. This circumcision of the heart is nothing other than the Lord granting the gift of faith to Israel as they prepare to enter the promised land. So if you wanted to whittle all of Deuteronomy down, what does it mean 
to be prepared to enter the promised land. It means to believe the promises of God. The promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can even go further back to Adam and Eve in the garden. And we can go all the way forward to the New Testament where we see all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. This faith, this faith in the promises of God begins in the heart with gracious work of the Holy Spirit through the word. God is telling Israel, you will never be enough. You will never do enough. You will never sacrifice enough. You will never have the right intentions. And yet, I will love you. I have chosen you, not because of you, but because of my great love for you, for my own glory, for my own namesake. And so Israel cannot trust in what they have. It's not as if they have any righteousness to offer. They can't trust in the fact that they're the ones who even went through the Red Sea. They can't trust in their right intentions or in their right sacrifices or in how well they do in packing and unpacking the tabernacle to the letter the way how God has commanded it. No, what they must trust in ultimately is in God, in his promises, in his word to them. It is circumcision of the heart. It is faith in the promises of God which defines God's people in the Old Testament. And this is also true for the New Testament. Paul makes this very, very clear for us in Romans and in Galatians. Romans 9, 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Galatians 3, verse 7 and 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This means that all your righteousness, all of your righteousness before God, needs to be sought outside of your merits, outside of your virtues, or your worthiness, or your enoughness, if that were a word, and outside of all other people, because your righteousness rests on Jesus Christ alone, upon his worthiness, his works, his merits, and his virtues. The response of those who have been given this faith is to truly fear, love, serve, and obey God. Yet as we saw with the generation that came out of Egypt, sometimes that natural causality, we call it, the the response of the believer in faith fails. Because in this life, we still carry around our sinful nature. We still struggle with sin. We still struggle with the weakness that it means to be a human. And we see it even with the people as they go in to eat into the promised land that they too get scared and they fail and they too sin. And so you see this in yourself. You desire to do good and you desire to love your neighbor and yet you get angry. You uh, seek your own desires to be gratified. You chase after the latest thing instead of chasing after God. And so Moses, he brings the law to bear. But notice who he's preaching this to. He's not preaching it to to the, the people on the other side of the Jordan River. He's not preaching it to the Moabites who were descendants, uh, 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 descendants who related to the Israelites or to the Edomites who were descended from Esau. No, he's, he's not preaching it to them. He's preaching it to those who were chosen. He was preaching it to those who were called. And he brings the law to bear because they need the law as well. And so the law comes in not only to accuse Israel and you of your sin, but to remind Israel and you of God's will, to guide you in his will. In this life, though you have begun to be be conformed completely to the mind of Christ, it remains incomplete. As long as you dwell in this life, you can expect to struggle against sin. Struggle against your sinful nature, your old Adam, sometimes we call it. You're gonna be, you know that you're going to have these 
these issues in life, and you see it in the world, you see it everywhere we look, that people struggle with sin. And so what we learn is not that we must obtain this perfection in and of ourselves, but instead that we too must circumcise our hearts. We too must look to the word of God and believe. And when we do this, we will repent of our sins. We will repent of our failures, of our lack of perfection. And in this way, we will receive the forgiveness of sin and we truly will be God's people. I've touched on this already, but I want to touch on this explicitly. That's, I think, important for us to understand. Sometimes Christians can become obsessed with making sure we have the right motivations. Oh, I can't take this box because I don't, I don't know if my heart's really in the right place for it, or I can't, can't go to, on this mission trip because my heart's maybe not in the right place for it. We are called, and it is good to be considering our intentions, our heart in the matter. But nevertheless, when we see that there's something that is right that we are to do, we are called to do it, friends. We're not called to stand by and wait. We're called to move in and do the right thing for our neighbors. And in doing so, then we we do what we should always do is we should repent of our bad intentions, of our own self-seeking in the matter. Because our neighbors are in great need. They're in need of your love and your care. And even though you will never love and care the way how you ought to, you nevertheless are called to love and care for them. And it's in this way, through daily repentance, you serve, cling to, praise your God who delivered you from death and sin unto eternal life. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.